what advice would you give yourself as a 20-year-old to give you the courage to do as you've done, to go into the impossible? And I asked Barry Barr. She's 80 years old. I said, Barry, what would you do? He said, I would make sure to tell my 20-year-old self to get over the imposter syndrome um, because I still haven't gotten over it. Mm. I said, what the hell are you talking about? You won the freaking Nobel Prize. You're among, like, there's, like, there's more people in the NBA right now, Joe, than are won the Nobel Prize in physics that are alive. Mm. Okay? It's, it's a very small group of people. At, at, at most, three people can win it every year. They typically win it when they're in the 70s and 80s, so their life expectancy isn't, like, super long. Sir Roger's 92 now. But when you win it, I said, I said what, how could you possibly have the imposter syndrome, this fear of inadequacy that you don't belong where you're at? that you don't deserve the accolades that you had. You won it. It was selected by 400 nerds in Sweden that said you are good enough to win the Nobel Prize. How could you? He said, no, Brian, when you win a Nobel Prize, you get the golden medal and you get the million dollars or your, your portion of the million dollar purse. But they also want to make sure that you, that you received it. You're not going to come back later and say, uh, where's my Nobel Prize? So they make you sign a ledger. They make you sign, uh, like, remember those old-fashioned autograph mm -hmm. books? And uh, they make you sign it. And he said, Barry told me, he said, I'm a curious guy, so what do I do? I look, you know, who won it last year? I saw some of my friends and advisors, maybe. Richard Feynman, wow, that's pretty cool. Marie Curie, Albert Einstein. His actual signature wow. in this book. Because it's only been around for 116 years or something like that. Um, so, there are a lot, there are, you know, goes back to Einstein, and he won in 1922. When he saw Einstein, he said, I am not worthy. I'm just some humble kid from you know, Nebraska. I don't, I don't belong here. How, how could I possibly be in the same book as Albert Einstein? And I said, Barry, I've got good news, and I've got good news. I said, did you know that um, Albert Einstein felt the imposter syndrome? He's like, you're kidding me. How could that possibly be? I said, no, Barry, he did. And I looked up this quote, and I showed it to him. I said, Albert Einstein called Isaac Newton not only the greatest scientist in history, but the man who single-handedly changed Western civilization more than any other person through the Principia and the study of, of natural determinism and laws. And I said, but wait, there's more. I said, Newton had the imposter syndrome. Who could he have imposter syndrome about? You might wonder. And if you read his writings, do you know what Isaac Newton, the creator of calculus, the uh, first person to understand universal gravitation, discovered laws of optics, do you know what his biggest accomplishment, according to him, was? What? He died a virgin. Yeah, that was a weird one, right? <laughs> yeah, yes. I was going to bring that up. He was celibate. You know why? Why? Because there's only one way that he could emulate his hero, his, the person before whom he felt the imposter syndrome. And who was that? That was Jesus Christ. Oh, boy. So he wanted to be Christ-like. He wanted to emulate Christ. And the only way he could do it, he couldn't, like, fast or I don't know. He couldn't baptize, walk on water. He couldn't turn uh, water into wine. He couldn't turn loaves into fishes or whatever Jesus also did. But he could die celibate. And that's who he had imposter syndrome. Are you sure he just didn't, was like an excuse for he didn't like sex? I don't know. I mean, it sounds nutty. <laughs> because, like, how do you figure that out when you're, like, guy. 14, 15 years old? You know, you're young and full of hormones, and you've made this decision to be like Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, he, he He was a strange guy. He sounds insane. He definitely was. He was not like Galileo. You would want to hang out with Galileo. If you I met know, Galileo, I probably want to hang out with him, too. Yeah, no. <laughs> for a little bit, just to see what it's like. So when you win the Nobel Prize, you go there, and what is the, what is the commandment about idol worship? It's that you shall make no gilded, golden, graven, like engraved images. So who is that? Do you know who that is? Uh, Albert Nobel? Yeah, it's Alfred Nobel. That's right. Alfred. And, you know, he invented dynamite. Uh, and he, he also died. He died uh, never having been married. I don't know if he was celibate. Hollow. <laughs> so he was never married. Um, but he, uh, he established this prize. When you win it, you literally, the king of Sweden comes up to you and you must bow down to him. Mm. And he puts the gilded graven image on your head. So for all the you know trappings and all the 90% of National Academy members who do not believe, actively profess a belief in God, this can become at some level a religion. And it's yeah. a kosher one. It's okay to worship. That's uh, right. <laughs> well, the unattainable for that, that's maybe perhaps attainable to a very select few is uh, always the thing that people are chasing after, especially like high achievers. That's right. But many, many that I know that get there do have imposter syndrome, including MMA world champions. 
Like some of them, they get there like, this isn't real. This can't be real. I can't be the man. Because they've set this up their whole yes. life. And also, it's, it's they do, look, you can get to the promised land, but you can't stay in it. How many baseball teams have won the uh, World Series year after year forever? I right. mean, even the Yankees haven't done that. Even your Bo Sox haven't done that, right? They're not so, mine. <laughs> okay, fine. 